there what? Real life. Real life. <laughs> Testing. Ah, maybe I had it on mute. Uh, anyway, we use that scripture. We point to that scripture because that is the scripture that the Lord used to correct the Millerites to produce that chart there on the left. Um, yeah, the passage of scripture that they were led to in connection with that chart is Ezekiel 12, verse 21 through 28, I believe. And we've dealt with that this week. I would recommend the tapes that have been made this week, and you'll see how we understand the significance of that passage. I believe the Millerite history is repeated here at this time in our history when the 144,000 are raised up. And that the fact that God is leading his people back to the foundational truths that are represented on those charts there um, is once again making those charts present truth in this particular history because this particular history is fulfilling the Millerite history to the very letter. And one of the passages that we've spent a great deal of time on this week, Revelation chapter 10, if you would turn there with me. Um, Revelation chapter 10 takes place at the conclusion of the sixth trumpet of Revelation. The pioneers believe that the sixth trumpet of Revelation concluded on August 11, 1840. Uh, we dealt with that this week. The pioneers were incorrect. The sixth trumpet ended on October 22, 1844. And Revelation chapter 10 is dealing with uh, with this very history, it begins on August 11th, 1840, when the mighty angel of Revelation 10, verse 1, comes down out of heaven with a little book open in his hand. Sister White tells us that this mighty angel is no less a person than Jesus Christ, and that the little book that's opened in his hand is the book of Daniel. In verses 8 through 10, the prophet John is told to go take the little book from Christ, the little book of Daniel, and eat it, and that it would be sweet in his mouth and become bitter in his stomach. Um, the book of Daniel became sweet for the Millerites on August 11, 1840, because it was at the fulfillment of that prophecy that the year-day principle of Bible prophecy that they were building so much of their message upon was confirmed before the world, and their message suddenly became sweet. Revelation chapter 10 is dealing with the history of 1840 to 1844, and it is illustrating not only the Millerite history, but it is illustrating the history when the 144,000 are raised up. We've dealt with that a great deal this week. But one thing that we haven't dealt with from this passage, and, and I, would, I would plead with you for those of you that are hearing the Holy Spirit um, spark your interest at all about what we're saying here about Revelation 10, that you, you want to look at what you missed, I would plead with you to go ahead and take advantage of the tape that has been made this week. I believe the message that we were sharing this week is the present truth message for God's people here at the end of the world. Perhaps we're wrong, but perhaps we're right, and if you haven't investigated it, you don't yet know whether it is right or wrong, and if it's right, we need to understand. Um, but we, one of the components that we did not look at, um, and we're going to try to do this this morning, is the fact that the Millerites ate the little book of Daniel. It's a prophetic message that is symbolized by the little book. And if this history is going to be repeated, there will be a little book, a little prophetic book, that we will have to partake of to parallel that history. Now, it's going to take me a moment to put this in place for you, but um, we're going to trust that most of us in this room are fairly well seasoned Seventh-day Adventists and that we understand certain truths um, corporately here that I don't have to, to teach them in depth. If you go to Revelation chapter 2, verse 12, you will see the message to Pergamon. Seventh-day Adventists understand correctly that the seven churches of Revelation represent the history of the Christian church from the time of the apostles until the end of the world. When you get to Pergamos, you are at the third church in this history. And this church is the church, if you were going to put a historical figure connected to it, would be Constantine. It's the church of compromise, which precedes the church of Thyatira, 
Church of Thyatira is illustrating the 1260 years of the papacy ruled the world. And you cannot separate Pergamus from Thyatira because it's the compromise and apostasy that comes into the church during the history of Pergamus that prepares the way and opens the door for the papacy, the Church of Thyatira. So when you look at the history of Pergamus and Thyatira, we're looking at histories that, that can't be separated. Sister White tells us that one of the reasons that Seventh-day Adventists aren't going to understand the truth is because they do not reason from cause to effect. Pergamus is the cause, Thyatira is the effect. We have to understand the connection between Pergamus and Thyatira. This particular prophetic history is illustrated several places in Scripture. If you turn to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, in verse 3 of chapter 2 of 2 Thessalonians, it says, Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 3. For that day shall not come, except there come a falling away first. The falling away here is the church of Pergamos. It's the compromise and the apostasy that came into the Christian church during the history of Pergamos. And that man of sin be revealed. The man of sin is the church of Thyatira. So Paul is talking about the identical history. He's giving a second line of prophecy covering the same history of Pergamos and Thyatira. That no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come, except there come a falling away first. And that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition, who opposes and exalted himself above all that is called God, or that is worshipped, so that he is God, set in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Remember ye not, that when I was with you, I told you these things. And now you know what withholdeth, that he might be revealed in his time. For the mystery of iniquity doth already work, only he who now letteth, he will let, until he be taken out of the way. And then shall that wicked be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth, and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. Now, brothers and sisters, this is a foundational passage to Adventism and to the Christian church. But it is this passage of scripture that William Miller concluded that the daily in the book of Daniel was paganism. Because William Miller, as he tells how he discovered that the daily is paganism, he makes comments where if you would read his statements, he says in verse 8, we know that the wicked is the papacy. We know that the man of sin is the papacy. We know that the son of perdition is the papacy. And we see here in this passage a power in verse 6 that's withholding the papacy. And in a power in verse 7 that is letting until he be taken out of the way. And this word letting, um, if you get more accurate to the Greek, it's restraining. It was a power that was restraining the papacy from taking control of the world. And it would continue to restrain the papacy from taking control of the world until it was taken out of the way. And when William Miller saw this, he says, he writes it this way, Oh, glorious thought, the daily is paganism. Amen. Because he'd been looking through the book of Daniel and trying to find out what was the daily that was taken away that allowed the abomination of desolation, the papacy to take control of the world. And when he realized that this power here that was restraining the papacy was the power that precedes the papacy and keeps it from taking control of planet Earth until it's taken out of the way, he made the connection that the daily is And it's illustrated on that chart over there. And on that chart over there, Sister White says that chart was directed by the hand of the Lord and should not be altered. And in early writings, page 74, where she says that, she goes on to say, I was shown that those that gave the judgment hour cry had the correct view of the daily. So William Miller's identification of the daily as paganism has been endorsed by inspiration. And it can be upheld by the Hebrew of Daniel, even if the modern theologians tell us otherwise. But my point here isn't so much today to today. My point is, is that the work of God's people at the end of the world in presenting the final warning message is to bring line upon prophetic line, here a little, there a little, and one line of prophecy is in the seven churches. It's Pergamos and Thyatira. Pergamos is the compromising church that allows for Thyatira, the papacy, to come in control of the world. And a second line that testifies to that history is here in 2 Thessalonians. Both paganism and papalism are addressed here in 2 Thessalonians. And of course, Constantine of Pergamos was a 
pagan power, the pagan power that's under discussion. I'll show you one more line to this history. I know that you don't know where I'm going at this point, but I don't have the time to explain where I'm going in advance, so just bear with me. If you go to Revo Daniel 11, verse 30, <clears throat> if you have the book, Thoughts on Revelation by Uriah Smith, Thoughts on Daniel and Revelation by Uriah Smith, or the book Daniel the Prophet by Haskell, they will tell you this, that verse 30 is talking about the history of pagan Rome. Verse 30 of Daniel 11. And verse 30, as it's discussing pagan Rome in the history where the Roman Empire is falling apart because the trumpet powers of Revelation 8 are blowing, and they're taking apart the empire of Rome piece by piece, that in the very last phrase of verse 30, dealing with pagan Rome, it says, and have intelligence with them that forsake the Holy Covenant. Those that forsook the Holy Covenant was the papal power. They were the church that fell away in Thessalonians. They forsook the true church and became the church of apostasy. And in verse 30, it's talking about a communication, a dialogue, an interaction that took place between the leaders of pagan Rome and the Roman church that came before the papacy was placed upon the throne of the earth. That is the correct understanding of this scripture. That is how the pioneers of Adventism understood the scripture. So what I'm saying is verse 30 and onward is also describing the identical history of Pergamos and Thyatira. It's the identical history of 2 Thessalonians. And in verse 31, continuing that history, it says an arm shall stand on his part. The his part here is the papacy. And the arms that stand up for the papacy are the seven European kings that are going to do the work identified in Daniel 7 of removing the three horns, the Urali, the Ostrogoths, and the Vandals. Military strength was to stand up for the papacy in this history and begin the work of removing the three horns prior to the papacy being placed upon the throne of the earth in the year 538. The papacy placed upon the throne of the earth in this passage at the very end of verse 31 where it says, and they, the arms, pagan Rome, shall place the abomination that made the desolate. The last phrase of verse 31 is the year 538, when pagan Rome placed the papacy on the throne of the earth, and this is where the church of Thyatira begins in history. Paganism had been taken out of the way, now the papacy is established. In the following verses, after the papacy is taken out of the way, you see the persecution that takes place through the 1260 years. Now, why am I going there? In Manuscript Releases, volume number 13, volume 13, page 394, Sister White says this, We have no time to lose. Troublous times are before us. The world is stirred with the spirit of war. Soon the scenes of trouble spoken <coughs> of in the prophecies will take place. Now notice what she says here. The prophecy in the 11th of Daniel has nearly reached its complete fulfillment. She's not talking about Daniel 7 or Daniel 8 or Revelation 13. She's talking about Daniel 11. She says, the prophecy in the 11th of Daniel has nearly reached its complete fulfillment. Much of the history that's taken place in fulfillment of this prophecy, Daniel 11, much of the history that's taken place in fulfillment of Daniel 11 will be repeated. In the 30th verse, a power is spoken of, and then she quotes verses 30 to 36 of Daniel 11. And she says when she finishes quoting those verses, scenes similar to those described in these words will take place. So what she's saying, she's pointing to Daniel 11, and if you've been a Seventh-day Adventist very long, you know like I do, a Seventh-day Adventist, we're very quick to explain Daniel 2 to a non-Adventist. And we can explain Daniel 7 to a non-Adventist. It's a little bit more difficult to describe Daniel 8, but we can do it. But Daniel 8, you've got to deal with the sanctuary. But brothers and sisters, we all know when it comes to Daniel 11, we don't explain that to anyone. All right, it's, just, it's too difficult to walk through that passage. And here's a passage where Sister White is giving us the key to understand Daniel 11. And she's saying... 
Daniel 11 has almost reached its fulfillment, and the key to understand it is that there are histories in Daniel 11 that will be repeated when the final part of Daniel 11 is fulfilled. Amen. And then she identifies the primary key. And the primary key is that verses 30 to 36, seeing similar to verses 30 to 36, will be repeated when Daniel 11 reaches its conclusion. And verses 30 to 36, brothers and sisters, is the history of Pergamos and Thyatira. Pergamos and Thyatira will be fulfilled at the end of the world one more time. It's the same history as 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. It is repeated at the end of the world. Just as pagan Rome set aside its religion of paganism to prepare the way for the papacy, the United States will set aside its religion, Protestantism, to prepare the way for the papacy at the end of the world. These histories are repeated at the end of the world. Now, in um, Great Controversy, page 594, Sister White says this, the events connected with the codes of probation and the work of preparation for the time, time of trouble have been clearly revealed. But multitudes have no more understanding of these important truths than if they have never been revealed. The events connected with the close of probation. Brothers and sisters, where is the close of probation identified? Turn with me, if you would, to Daniel 12.1. Daniel 12.1 says, And at that time shall Michael stand up, the great prince, which standeth for the children of thy people, and there shall be a time of trouble, such as never was since there was a nation. Sister White is clear. When Michael stands up, human probation closes. So in 594, a great controversy, when she says the events connected with the close of probation have been clearly revealed, those events are the last six verses of Daniel 11 that lead to Daniel 12.1. <clears throat> the reason I'm saying the last six verses is because verse 40 of Daniel 11 begins this way. Verse 40 of Daniel 11 says, and at the time of the end, and Great Controversy 356 says the time of the end is 1798. So verse 40 begins in 1798, and that history runs right into the time when Michael stands up and human probation closes. But Sister White says these verses, verses 40 to 45, within those verses, when Daniel 11 is fulfilled, the scenes that are illustrated in verses 30 to 36 of Daniel 11 will be repeated. Or, the scenes that are illustrated in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 will be repeated when verses 40 to 45 take place. And verses 40 to 45 are the events that lead to the close of probation that have been clearly revealed. And those events are paralleling the events of Pergamos and Thyatira. Okay? Follow me? Maybe? Okay. Now we spent some time here this week looking at a passage in Early Writings, page 259, where Sister White takes the time period of Christ and talks about a progressive testing process from John the Baptist until the ascension of Christ in Pentecost. And she's progressive. She says, all those that would not receive the message of John the Baptist could not be benefited by the teachings of Jesus. She says, those who rejected the teachings of Jesus went still further, they crucified him, and they could see no light into the sanctuary in heaven. That's a paraphrase, but that's what she says. It was a progressive testing process. And she, after she finishes that paragraph of that history, and what history is that? That's the history of Ephesus. Sister White takes the history of Ephesus, the first church, where the church is raised up on a white horse, the first seal, and carries the gospel to the world. Sister White takes that history, and in the next paragraph, she compares it to the history of the Millerites. In the history of the Millerites, there was a progressive testing process that if you didn't receive the first angel's message, then you didn't accept the second. And if you didn't accept the second, along with the first, then you wouldn't be benefited by the midnight cry. And if you weren't benefited by the midnight cry, you did not have the spiritual ability to move into the most holy place with Christ on October 22nd, 1844, and you ended up praying to Satan. And that's a paraphrase of what she says. But it's accurate. Therefore, what Sister White has done in early writings, page 259, is she's taken the history that's represented by the Church of Ephesus, and she's compared it 
to the history represented by the Church of Philadelphia, because the Millerite history was the Church of Philadelphia. Does everyone understand that? Say amen if you do. Amen. So she's saying that the history of Ephesus is repeated in the history of Philadelphia. And brothers and sisters, those of you that have been here this week, we've given you at least eight strong arguments that the history of the Millerites, the history of Philadelphia, is being repeated now in the history of Laodicea. We demonstrated reform movement after reform movement that identified that they all parallel one another. Those of you who are, that were here this week, please raise your hand if you've seen a multitude of arguments that demonstrate that the Millerite history is repeated at the end of the world so that pre the brothers and sisters that weren't here will understand that this was established here. Okay. The arguments were made. The point is this. The history of Philadelphia is repeated in the history of Laodicea. And Sister White teaches that the history of Ephesus is repeated in the history of Philadelphia. So the history of Ephesus is repeated in the history of Laodicea, just like it's repeated in the history of Philadelphia. But you know something that we understand the Seventh-day Adventists? We understand very clearly that all those that live godly in Christ Jesus will what? Suffer what? Persecution. You cannot separate the Ephesus church from the Smyrna church. The church of Ephesus in the book of Revelation is talking about the white horse, the first seal, that went out in the power of the Holy Spirit and carried the gospel to the world, demonstrating the righteousness of Christ. And the cause and effect of that history was the church of Smyrna, where the church was persecuted. They cannot be separated. Therefore, when you bring the church, the history of the church of Ephesus down to Laodicea, you bring with it the church of Smyrna. Amen. So what I'm saying, brothers and sisters, once you understand the seven thunders, and some of you haven't heard how we deal with the seven thunders, but in verse 4 of Revelation 10, the seven thunders are sealed up. And in verse 10 and 11 of Revelation 22, we are told that just before probation closes, the prophecy in the book of Revelation that is, un that is sealed up will be unsealed. So just before the close of probation, whatever the seven thunders represent, it's unsealed to God's people's understanding. And Sister White tells us that the seven thunders represents the principle that the Millerite history is repeated when the 144,000 are developed. And when you understand that principle, it gives you a point of reference to go into Bible prophecy and demonstrate that all seven of the churches are repeated during the time period of Laodicea. Now, if you study the, the Millerite writings, they will tell you that in their history, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea were all fulfilled. The, the Millerites taught and believed that those people that were involved in the Millerite movement that were faithfully giving the message in that group of Millerites were Philadelphians. But within that group, there were people that were fighting against the message. They were getting off course, and those people were the Laodiceans. But they taught that there was a third group, and that third group was the point of reference for giving the message, and that group was the group of Sardis. I have quotes from the pioneers. Joseph Bates says plainly that there were three churches operating in the history of the Millerites. Sardis, the, the point to carry the message to, and the messengers consisting of two groups, Laodiceans and Philadelphians. But the Millerite history is going to be repeated to the very end. Therefore, at the end of the world, in Adventism, there will be two classes of worshipers. There will be the wise virgins and the foolish virgins. And then there will be a third class, those people that are still in Babylon that will hear the message that's proclaimed by the wise virgins when they receive the seal of God. And those people that are still in Babylon are Sardis. And those people that give the message are Philadelphia. And those in Adventism that are preparing their character for the mark of the beast are Laodiceans. Therefore, what I'm saying is that all seven churches take place at the end of the world. Now, you may think some place where Brother Hippinger's I feel it's stretching it, but how many of you know who Stephen Haskell is? Stephen Haskell's identified as a, a faithful man in our history, and he wrote a book on the book of Revelation called The Seer of Patmos. Let me 
Let me read you some of his thoughts on the seven churches. Sir Patmos, page 69. It should be remembered that as the experience of Ephesus, Smyrna, and Pergamos will be repeated in the last church. Ephesus, Smyrna, and Pergamos will be repeated in the last church before the second of the coming yeah. of Christ. So the history of Thyatira will have its counterpart in the last generation. So what I just went over and tried to show you through some logic, this is an established understanding in Adventism that we don't really know any longer because the foundational truths have been sealed by to our understanding. And page 75, on the same book, it says, he applied the test, but all pointed, speaking of Miller, but all pointed forward to the year 1843 as the time when the world must welcome its Savior. The condition of the people at the first advent of Christ was now repeated. We saw the history of Ephesus and the history of the Millerites, the history of Philadelphia. Page 69 of the same book, Haskell says this, Upon this last church, the remnant, shine the accumulated rays of all the past ages. See, brothers and sisters, when you understand the principle of the seven thunders, that the Millerite history is repeated at the end of the world to the very letter, it gives you a prophetic key that allows you to go in and analyze the lines of prophecy. And what you discover is, as we demonstrated this week, that when the children of Israel were captive in Babylon, and the Lord brought them out of Babylon, that that was a parallel history to when the Millerites were brought out of spiritual Babylon in 1798. It's the same history being repeated. But it was also the same history as when the children of Israel were captive in Egypt, and they were brought out to Sinai. It's the same history repeated. Therefore, the history of the deliverance of the Jews from Egypt and the history of the captivity of the Jews in Babylon and coming out of Babylon, those are parallel lines of prophecy, and they line up with Millerite history. But Millerite history is to be repeated to the very letter at the end of the world. Therefore, the history of, of the deliverance of Egypt and the history of the deliverance from Babylon and the history of the Millerites are three lines of prophecy that are all fulfilled at the end of the world. Now, you, this, I'm going to get theoretical on you, and you may not, you may not follow what I'm going to say here. Because I probably don't know how to say it well. But brothers and sisters, when you have this key, it allows you to take these historical lines of prophecy and bring them down to the end of the world. And the end of the world, the events connected with the close of probation, the point of reference for the end of the world, is Daniel 11, 40, 45. And upon the, the prophetic structure of the last six verses of Daniel 11, the events connected with the close of probation have been clearly revealed, but multitudes have no more understanding of these important truths than if they've never been revealed. Upon the sequence of events that's portrayed in verses 40 to 45 of Daniel 11, you can bring the Millerite history, you can bring the history of the rebuilding of Jerusalem, you can bring the history of Ephesus, the history of Smyrna, the history of Pergamos, Thyatira, Sardis, and Philadelphia together. And when you do this, and this is the theoretical part, the Bible it shrinks. It becomes a little book. It becomes a book that is always pointing and building upon one little passage of Scripture which is the last six verses of Daniel 11. And when God's people understand that key that allows them to open the prophetic word and start realizing that in the church of Pergamos, when it's talking about Balaam seducing God's people, that the story of Balaam in the Old Testament is fulfilled in the last six verses of Daniel 11. Or when the church of Thyatira is talking about the papal church and it uses Jezebel, to symbolize the papal church that allows the student of prophecy to bring the story of carnal right down here to the end of the world. When we realize that, we have a little book in our hand, and it becomes sweet. It becomes sweet. And brothers and sisters, the line of the tribe of Judah has opened this truth to God's people 
now. Amen. He's come down with the little book open in his hand. And those of you that weren't here don't, here don't realize that it did, well, you maybe realize that you did hear our presentation on this thought, and we already understand that when John takes the little book from the angel's hand in verses 8 through 10 of Revelation 10, and he eats the little book, he's building on what the Bible says about when a prophet eats the little book. And in Ezekiel 3 and Jeremiah 15, it teaches us that when a prophet eats the little book, it's marking a testing process for God's people. That at that point, Ezekiel and Jeremiah are empowered to carry a message to God's people that they do not want to hear and that they will oppose. And sure enough, you can mark that when John took the little book in Revelation 10 on August 11th, 18. 40 and ate it, a testing process began in the Millerite history that concluded with only 50 out of 50,000 passing the test. So when we're saying to you that the line of the tribe of Judah has now come down with the little book of Daniel open in his hand, and it's now time to eat it and see how sweet it is, we're also saying that the final testing process, which produces 144,000, is underway. And that testing process is clearly illustrated in the scriptures. But you know where else it's clearly illustrated? It's illustrated in our history. In our history, brothers and sisters, there was a time when the Lord attempted to start this testing process and bring about the latter rain. When was that time? 1888. So that history... Each of the ancient prophets spoke more about the end of the world than the days in which they lived. That's what Sister White said. And as soon as she says that, she quotes 1 Corinthians 10, 11. Now all these things happen as an example. Therefore, Sister White is one of the ancient prophets. What she wrote is speaking about the last days too. And what she wrote about 1888 is a message for us here living at the end of the world, among other things, telling us our responsibility when the final warning message comes to our attention. Now notice, I'm going to read some quotes here concerning 1888, and you have the prophetic authority, you have the prophetic responsibility to take those passages about 1888 and bring them down to today because they're speaking more about now than they were then. At the end of the world, there will be a message it comes to God's people, and you and I will have the ability to respond to that message just the way Jones and Wagner's message was responded to in 1888. And brothers and sisters, we don't want to make the wrong choice on this message. Yes. Selected Messages, Book 1, page 235 says, An unwillingness to yield up preconceived opinions. Before I walked up here this morning, there was a Latin brother, I don't know if they're translating this in the back, he gave me a question I did not have time to answer because we were going into the room to pray. And he wasn't here this week. And he says, you know, I heard a little bit about what you said, that, that the mighty angel came down on September 11, 2001, and you're saying that it was Islam that took down the Twin Towers, but I've seen the... The DVD presentation that shows you that it's George Bush and the Jesuits and the CIA that took down the Twin Towers. All right. <coughs> if you were here this week, you'll realize that we do mark September 11, 2001 as the beginning of the Third World and the beginning of the outpouring of the Holy Spirit upon God's people and the beginning of the testing time in Adventism. We do mark that. But what we say that marks that is it just as August 11th, 1840 was fulfilled when the four great European powers put a restraint on Islam on September 11, 2001, no matter who blew up the Twin Towers, a restraint was put upon Islam as George Bush went to the United Nations and said, you're either for us or against us, we're now in a worldwide war of terrorism, and he immediately went into Afghanistan and Iraq, and we're saying that no matter who blew up the Twin Towers, the Millerite history is being repeated, and we better set aside our preconceived ideas and make sure that Bible prophecy isn't confirming this truth, because if it is, we're getting on the wrong side of the issue, because when it comes to 1888, Sister White says, 
an unwillingness to yield up preconceived opinions and accept this truth lay at the foundation of a large share of the opposition manifested at Minneapolis against the Lord's message through Brethren Wagner and Jones. By exciting that opposition, Satan succeeded in shutting away from our people in a great measure the special power of the Holy Spirit that God longed to impart. The enemy prevented them from obtaining that efficiency which might have been theirs in carrying the truth to the world as the apostles proclaimed it after the day of Pentecost. The light that is to lighten the whole earth with its glory was resisted and by the action of our own brother, brethren has been in a great degree kept away from the world. Now, brothers and sisters, you may wonder how I can read something like this and know that the, the message of Jones the Wagner's is justification by faith in verity and how can I say September 11, 2001 has anything to do with justification by faith in verity? We read passages in here this week. It's recorded on, on the tape. Sister White says the prophetic message that comes to God's people is to be used by the Holy Spirit to arouse us of our unprepared condition and convict us of our sins that we might make preparation. And if you and I are aroused to our condition and the Holy Spirit convicts us of our sin, brothers and sisters, that is justification by faith in verity. Yeah. But we've been conditioned in Adventism to think that the fourth angel's message was Jones and Wagner's message, and the fourth angel's message is simply going to be someone standing in front of us explaining the details of the gospel justification, sanctification, confession, repentance, paralleling what Jones and Wagner did. But we looked at the reform movements, brothers and sisters, through the history, the sacred history of 6,000 years. And God's reform movements always begin with a prophetic message that is a testing message. Something in the world is about to take place, and there's a message from prophecy that reveals what that is, and that message is what tests God's people. The Seventh-day Adventist Bible Commentary, page 984, says, We must not wait for the latter rain. It is coming upon all who will recognize and appropriate the due and showers of grace that fall upon us. Brothers and sisters, if we're going to receive the latter rain, we have to recognize it. That's why in Testimonies to Ministers, page 507, she says, unless we're daily advancing in the exemplification of active Christian virtues, we shall not recognize the manifestation of the Holy Spirit in the latter rain. It may be falling in hearts all around us, but we shall not discern or receive it. What we're saying is the latter rain is falling. And what we're saying is that in a group like this, in Adventism, there's some of us that are recognizing that the latter rain is falling, and we have the possibility of discerning and receiving it. But there's another group in here that doesn't recognize it, and they don't receive it. In other words, the latter rain begins to fall before the Sunday law. It begins to fall while the people here are still together. <coughs> the Sunday law, the church is separated. And those of us that have prepared a character for the mark of the beast will receive the mark of the beast and demonstrate it. And those of us that have prepared a character for the seal of God receive the seal of God. And then the Holy Spirit is poured out without measure. Have you ever wondered why we're told there's a point where the Holy Spirit is poured out without measure? Because when the Holy Spirit first is poured out, it has to be poured out with, with measure because it's poured out in a group of people, some who are recognizing it and some who aren't. So it has to be measure. That two groups are separated, then the Lord pours out the Spirit without baby. And, I, and if this is new thought from the latter rain for you, it doesn't surprise me. They have done a number in trying to prevent us from understanding what the latter rain is. Council on Sabbath School Work, page 25. In searching the scriptures, you are not to endeavor to interpret the utterances so as to agree with your preconceived ideas, but come as a learner to understand the foundational principles of Jesus Christ. And brothers and sisters, those of you that were here this week, we spent a great deal of time on the foundations of Adventism. And the Bible teaches very plainly, no other foundation can be laid except Jesus Christ. In teaching the foundations of Adventism, we were teaching Jesus Christ. We were teaching the foundational principles. And when it comes to studying the foundational principles, the 
worst thing we can do is to refuse to set aside our preconceived opinion. Especially when we know that we're made to see. We are those that are standing in opposition to the greatest light of all time, deceiving ourselves that Christ is with us when he's outside of us. He writes, there's no greater, no greater deception can come upon a human mind than to think that everything is all right when everything is all wrong. And she makes that statement when she's describing the condition of we Laodiceans. Brothers and sisters, you may now be following the logic of what I'm sharing about prophecy. You may not be one that is that tends to study prophecy, in spite of the fact that Sister White says every Seventh-day Adventist is called to be a student of prophecy. There are some of us in this group that think that we can pick and choose what we study, but we are all called to be students of prophecy. And this may not be making sense to some of us, but the reality of it is, until we're willing to set aside our preconceived opinions at the door of investigation, we're on a march to death. Because the truth of God comes in a way that isn't based upon human understanding. God is far above us. Amen. Evangelism 196 says the minister should present the sure word of prophecy as the foundation of the faith of seventh day Adventists. Mm -hmm. Do you ask, this is Christ's Object Blessings, page 112, do you ask, what shall I do to be saved? You may lay aside your preconceived opinions, your hereditary and cultivated ideas at the door of investigation. Brothers and sisters, there's some of you that had absolutely legitimate reason that you couldn't attend this week. But there's some of you that if your favorite speaker had been having meetings here this week, you would have been here every night. I'm an Adventist too, right? But brothers and sisters, the claim we're making about this message is something that you need to investigate. You need to set her outside the preconceived opinion. And you can do so because you see those cameras back there. All of this has been recorded. You still have opportunity to investigate what has went on here this week. And why should you investigate it? Because there is a possibility that what we're sharing is essentially correct. And therefore it is light. And in Review and Herald, July 21st, 1896, it says, if the truth for this time, and that's what we're saying about this message, this is the truth for this time. If the truth for this time, if the signs that are thickening on every hand, do you see any signs in the world? Do you see any hurricanes, any earthquakes, any wars, any economic collapse, any incurable diseases? If the truth for this time if the signs that are thickening on every hand that testify that the end of all things is at hand are not sufficient to arouse the sleeping energy of those that profess to know the truth, then darkness, proportionate to the light which has been shining, will overtake these souls. There is not a semblance of an excuse for their indifference that they will be able to present to God in the great day of the final record. Brothers and sisters, you know full well as a seventh day out of this that at some point in time, you're going to get to the end of the world. But when you get to the end of the world, there's going to be a message saying, we're at the end of the world. But because we're seventh day Adventists in a Laodicean condition, we don't think the end of the world is quite here yet. Correct? But I'm submitting to you, brothers and sisters. I happen to believe that what we've been sharing here is the message at the end of the world. And it is fatal to let our preconceived ideas and our Laodicean condition prevent us from investigating this information. It is absolutely fatal. Speaking of the mighty angel that comes down from Revelation, in Revelation 18, she quotes Revelation 18, verses 1 and 2, which is the loud rain message, which is the loud cry of the third angel. That's how we correctly understand it in Adventism. She says this, after she quotes verses 1 and 2, Well now, how are we going to know anything about that message if we are not in a position to recognize anything of the light of heaven when it comes to us? Brothers and sisters, we have to recognize 
when the mighty angel comes down. And the mighty angel of Revelation 10 came down to the Millerite history when there was a restraint put upon Islam by the four great European powers. And for me to tell you that the mighty angel of Revelation 18 came down when there was a restraint put upon Islam in the world should be, even though it's just a simple argument, it should be enough of an argument to stimulate your sanctified curiosity to see if the arguments along with that that we presented all week long are valid. Brothers and, sisters, brothers and sisters, let me give you one of them. In Isaiah 58, 12, it says, the work of the 144,000, one of the works of the 144,000, and for those of you that are getting sleepy, we are almost done. <laughs> one of the works of the 144,000 on Isaiah 58, 12 is to return to the old past, to the ancient past, to raise up the foundations of many generations. And this week, We've identified that right over there on those walls, those two charts represent the foundational ancient past, the foundational truths of Adventism. And by returning to those truths, we understand that the Millerite history is repeated at the end of the world. And therefore, that history is going to parallel our history. And we're saying that in the Millerite history, what started, what brought the angel down in Revelation 10 was when Islam had a restraint placed upon it. And we're saying that when Islam was restrained here at the end of the world, that this history begins with the mighty angel of Revelation 18 coming down. But we know it's says that the Adventists, when the mighty angel of Revelation 18 comes down, that the sealing of the 144,000 begins. That's how we've always understood it in Adventism. And that's correct. If you understand that, say amen. amen. That's the latter rain. So Sister White has a passing. We shared it this week. Selected Messages Book 3. For she tells us what the winds of strife in Revelation 7 are. And we know in Adventism that when the winds of strife are restrained, that the sealing of 144,000 begins. But when you see the winds of strife restrained, you know you've reached the point in time where the latter rain and the ceiling of the 144,000 begins. And you know what Sister White says symbolizes the four winds that are restrained? She says it's an angry horse. An angry horse waiting to break forth and be, bring destruction and ruin over the whole world. Now, brothers and sisters, if you're going to maintain the foundations of Adventism, and you want to know what the angry horse was understood to be in the Millerite history, all you have to do is look at those two charts. Because when it comes to the fifth and sixth trumpet, it's represented on both those charts. You look up there, you see those angry war horses? That represents Islam. So when Sister White says the four winds that are restrained are represented by an angry horse, the angry horse the Bible prophecy that is understood in the foundational message of Adventism is Islam. There are other arguments to be made for brothers and sisters. The sitting time is underway. The test of time is underway. And we don't have a possibility for passing the test unless we are willing to set aside our preconceived opinion at the door of investigation. I don't mean throw away our mind or we're mindless uh, robots, but let's just admit that we're at the end of the world in the lay of the same condition, and it's time for the Lord to forewarn his people about what's about to take place, because that's what the Bible says. The Bible says, Surely the Lord thy God will do nothing except he reveal it through his servants, the prophets. Brothers and sisters, do you think he's going to come to the end of the world when it's time to seal his people and not forewarn them? How's he going to forewarn them? Through Bible prophecy, because he never changes. And that's how it's always been Why is it that men do not believe upon sufficient evidence? Because they do not want to be convinced. They have no disposition to give up their own will for God's will. They are unwilling to acknowledge that they have cherished sinful unbelief in resisting the light that God has given them. They've been hunting for doubts, for pegs upon which to hang their unbelief. They've been ready to accept testimony which is weak and insufficient. Testimony which God has not given them in his word. 
but which pleases them because it agrees with their ideas and is in harmony with their disposition and will. Can I have just a little room here? I know I might just step on your toes there. I really don't need to step on your toes. But I want to make a point. In Adventism, the prophetic message we like is based upon conspiracy theories. And some of the conspiracy theories are 100% spot on. No doubt the Jesuits have been doing their work for hundreds of years. And no doubt about it, it's Freemasonry that has set up the United Nations, which is the dragon power. And no doubt it, about it, Rome is behind the scenes pulling the strings. But brothers and sisters, all that conspiracy garbage that's connected with that is not Bible prophecy. It's simply current events. And it's time that God's people set aside the current events and come to understand end time Bible prophecy from the Bible and the spirit of prophecy first. Amen. 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 They have been ready to accept testimony which is weak and insufficient, testimony which God has not given them in his word, but which pleases them because it agrees with their ideas and is in harmony with their disposition and will. These souls are in great peril. If they will bow with their proud will and put it on God's side of the question, if they will with humble and pride heart seek for light, believing that there is light for them, then they will see light because the eye is single to discern the light which comes from God. They will acknowledge the evidence of divine authority. Spiritual truths will shine forth from the divine page, but the heart must be open for the reception of light, for Satan is every, ever ready to obscure the precious truth which would make them wise in the salvation. If any do not receive it, it will forever remain a mystery to them. Review and Herald, December 3rd, 1890. There is to be in the Seventh-day Adventist churches a wonderful manifestation of the power of God. And Sister White tells us that the Advent movement of 1840 to 1844 was a wonderful manifestation of God. That's in Great Controversy 611. And when she tells us that, she's comparing it to the history when the mighty angel of Revelation 18 comes down, and at the end of that paragraph, she compares it to Pentecost. The, the manifestation of God's power are these sacred histories that illustrate the time period when the latter rain is poured out. And she says, there is to be in the seventh in Seventh-day Adventist churches a wonderful manifestation of the power of God, but it will not move upon those who have not humbled themselves before the Lord and opened the door of heart by confession and repentance. In the manifestation of that power which lightens the earth with the glory of God, they will see only something which in their blindness they think is dangerous. Brothers and sisters, some of you were here all week long. We recently shared this message with a group of people five months ago, and there was one of those leaders that over and over again would stand up and say, what we're hearing here, I agree with the prophetic message. I think the way that Brother Pippinger is setting out the prophetic message is correct. The sequence is correct. But it's dangerous. And I have it on tape. He said it more than once. It's dangerous. They will see only something which in their blindness they think dangerous, something which will arouse their fears and they will brace themselves to resist it. But the Lord does not work according to their ideas and expectations. That because the Lord does not work according to their ideas and expectations, they will oppose the work. Why, they say, should we not know the Spirit of God when we've been in the work so many years? The third angel's message will not be comprehended. The light which will lighten the earth with its glory will be called a false light by those who refuse to walk in its advancing glory. Brothers and sisters, when John ate the little book in the Millerite history, he was doing nothing more than when Jeremiah ate the little book and when Ezekiel ate the little book. It's identifying a testing process. And the worst thing to be is in a testing process when you don't even know there's a test happening around you. And there's a test going on in Adventism about the prophetic message that's unfolding to God's people right now. And it would be in your best interest to study it out and make sure if what I'm presenting is correct or incorrect. Because if it's correct, if the people of the world are to be convinced of sin as transgressors of God's law, the 
the agency must be the Holy Spirit working through human instrumentality. The church needs now to shake off her death-like slumber, for the Lord is waiting to bless his people who will recognize his blessing when it comes and diffuse it in clear, strong rays of light. Then will I sprinkle clean water upon you, and ye shall be clean, and I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes. The wilderness of the church is to become as a fruitful field, and the fruitful field to be as a forest. It is through the Holy Spirit of God poured out upon his people. Brothers and sisters, the Holy Spirit is poured out upon those that recognize that we're in the time. That's why Zechariah says, Pray for the latter rain in the time of the latter rain. It doesn't just say pray for the latter rain. It says you have to know that you're in the time of the latter rain to pray for the latter rain. Manuscript releases, volume 15, page 308, 309. And there's no way we could summarize all the week's arguments into one presentation this morning. I just can't. But I hope we challenge those of you that were here all week, yeah. and those of you that weren't here all week, that what the information that was shared in the period of the is of vital importance if it's true. If it's true. Of course, I, I'm certain my heart that it is true. And I have a responsibility because of that. To get up on the walls and, and sound the trumpet. And if I do so, according to the spirit of prophecy, if I get up on the wall and sound the trumpet, you know what that means? That when you hear the trumpet, you're supposed to raise up your trumpet and send that warning message all down the line. Brothers and sisters, that's what you need to be done this right now. The watchman has a to sound that trumpet. And the things is at hand, and we're still sleeping on. So we pray. Do we want to have a closing song? But I don't have a closing. What's our closing?